Well, good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the F Financial Times, can I offer my thanks to all of you for coming along this morning for what promises to be a truly fantastic second day of debates about cities. Um, what we are discussing right now is a question of economic powerhouses. How do you become one? How do you not become one? What are the smart things to do? What are the mistakes to avoid? And just to frame the debate, here are three numbers to think about in relation to the question of cities and economics. Firstly, right now, 42 out of the top 100 global entities in the world are cities. It's not just countries, it's cities that are increasingly important. Secondly, 80%. 80% of global GDP right now is found in and generated by cities. And lastly, 29% of the top global 500 companies are found in only five cities. Those are Beijing, London, New York, Paris, and Tokyo. Sadly, not Chicago, or not yet, but there is a lot to play for. So we're going to hear from the panelists this morning, all of whom are very much engaged in the question of cities and economic growth, about what they could or should be doing to try and drive that. Um, I won't make long bio introductions because the bios are in the um, packets, but very briefly, at the end on my far left, your right is Charles Bauman, the Lord Mayor of London. Um, next to him is Olokonyin Sola Ajayi, who is an advisor to the United Nations and others about how to develop growth in Africa. Next to him is Hannah Gronkio as well, who is the mayor of Warsaw, and in fact the first female mayor of Warsaw and the first female central bank governor in Poland. Next to her is Peter Fatelnik, who is the minister councillor for digital economic policies in the delegation of the European Union to the US. That means he's in the hot seat right now in dealing with all the transatlantic digital technology issues, like the one we have on the front page of the FT today. Next to him is Will McWilliams, who is partner and practice leader at um, Grant Thornton. He's an advisor on many of the infrastructure and city issues. And immediately next to me is Wang Huawao, who is founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, which is a think tank. So a very diverse, group of perspectives about what makes cities work or not work from an economic perspective. But since we had a British perspective yesterday, I'd like to start perhaps with our two um, emerging markets panelists, both Nigeria and China. Maybe start with Yu Wang and ask, in your views, what are the key steps that cities need to take to become true powerhouses? and what should they not do? Thank you, yes. I think this is a really great uh, uh, question and also a great panel to John. Thank you for the invitation. I think that uh, you know, for the last uh, 40 years, for example, since, since China has opened up, uh, there's about uh, 150 cities now come to the population of over 1 million. There's about 13, 14 cities in China that have population over 10 million. So, so I think that, uh, you know, drawing from the, uh, the China experience, we can see that, uh, uh, one other thing I can see that the infrastructure played an enormous role, that to, not only for the hardware, but also software, social, um, education, hospital. So this kind of thing, a uh, uh, fabric of uh, uh, successful uh, cities, uh, uh, of course. And also second, I think, is also the, uh, the, the, the talent. You know, we, for example, when China just started uh, uh, the, the, the opening up uh, 40 years ago, there's only annually they take about 200,000 college graduates. Now in one year they, they produce 8.5 million. So, so you can see all those uh, uh, infrastructure and, and also uh, 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 you know, the, the education talent supported the development of Chinese cities. And finally, I think it's very important is the, uh, is the, uh, the integration and how to really make integration work. And, uh, and also, for example, in China, in the last uh, 40 years, there's about 700 million people out of poverty. Mm. Half of that probably went to cities. So how to better integrate you know, those people come to the city is extremely important. So I think that the pitfall and uh, the challenge, I think, for China is also how to integrate this uh, rural you know, migrant who come to the city. You know, the hukou system, which is still a dual track system. And I think that uh, really we need to abolish that and really to 
um, you know, get all the, uh, the same recognition. So, so equality and uh, uh, talent and infrastructure, I think, are the fundamental, very important development for the cities. Okay, so your top three are equality, talent, and infrastructure. One of the things we found at the Financial Times is that whenever we run pieces saying three things you need to know to invest wisely or four things to watch out this week in the company results, everyone reads that. So giving three points is a very, um, very powerful way to do that. But um, Coyne, I'd like to turn to you and ask from your perspective in Nigeria, what are the key things? Um, before I do though, can I quickly ask, can your conference organizers switch on the clock please, countdown clock? Otherwise, we may end up talking all morning because I can't see where the time is going. So can somebody please do the clock for me? Thank you. Coin. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think in the case of uh, Nigeria, I'll speak through Lagos, uh, which tells the tale of two cities. And what we know um, is that, you know, um, 50 years ago, Lagos was just... Um, two to three million, projected to go to five million in another 50 years, uh, but now has a population of 20 million um, in land the size of New Mexico. And um, Lagos now is the third largest economy in Africa, is, takes 90% of foreign in, uh, investments that comes into the country, um, is responsible for 65% of manufacturing output and generates 75% of its budget internally. Nigeria is a federal state, so there's you know, allocation of money from the federal government. Now, what makes Lagos stand out as an economic powerhouse is largely its ability to generate income internally. Compared to other states in the country, um, which largely rely on the federal government for funding. Uh, Lagos State is able to do a lot of things itself and do uh, a lot of public-private uh, initiatives to improve the city. The, the second thing Lagos State has done uh, to continue to attract people to it at a rate of 86 people every hour, uh, which is like um, you know, 20,000 people every month come to live in Lagos. Uh, what it has done is leverage on technology as, as best as it can and has been very active with its um, power, environment, and transport projects in increasing employment. So to, to, to the government, the important thing is improve employment capabilities, improve ability to generate income, and at the back of this is a very good public service that has very good public policy. And what this has done for the country as a whole is that Lagos State is now the model that even the federal government itself is copying with respect to data collection, tax collection, and infrastructure rollout. Wow. Well, that is quite, as somebody who's seen Lagos over the years and knows it, um, that's really quite remarkable uh, in terms of the transformation. Yeah. Um, Hannah, what about you? What are your top priorities in terms of making Warsaw a vibrant city? Yes, I think that uh, uh, Warsaw is attractive for the business because it supports talents, leadership, and uh, innovation. And I would like to mention that we are the third in the uh, Financial Times top 10 major European cities friendly for business, which is, I think, very good result. Of course, I don't want to mention all kinds of these ratings, but because uh, Financial Times is here, so I would like to highlight. Well, if it's a Financial Times rating, it must be true, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I can add, we are first of uh, foreign direct investment policy cities of the future, and second of the foreign direct Eastern European cities of the future as well. So, but coming back to the precise reasons, I would say that we have a quite a high quality of life because uh, uh, very often it happens to me when they, um, the ambassadors, when ambassadors pay visit uh, to, 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 to me, they say, oh, I didn't expect that it's so good quality of life in Poland before I was sent to, to Warsaw. And uh, also very excellent uh, public transport. I should say that it's uh, cheap, 
and very modern because we modernize uh, transport thanks to the uh, to the EU funds and also we got numerous hubs for entrepreneurs for example uh, Google campus which is uh, in London in Tel Aviv and in, in Warsaw so it means that uh, we are highly evaluated there is fab lab by orange branch of Cambridge Innovation Center and brain embassy so uh, high level of safety I should say that uh, Warsaw is the eighth safest capital in the world. It's very important for the people who, who move into to, 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 to the city. And uh, almost 80% of residents feel safe in Warsaw when it is dark. Right. So this is very important. Smart city. We have very good education. Uh, 250,000 students and about uh, 50,000 different foreign students mainly from eastern part of Europe, I mean Ukraine, Belarus, but also from, from uh, far away as well. So I think these are, these are the main, uh, the main uh, points where we are at, uh, very attractive for, for the business. And uh, of course we deliver many projects which are uh, for the startup, we have uh, projects aimed uh, at young residents of Warsaw, so this is very right. important. A startup jump uh, trains high school students in entrepreneurship. In Fox Creative Business Semester is run in cooperation with the Warsaw University of Technology. We have very close cooperation with certain universities, and also we have even mathematics for curious for high school students. Right. So, so th these are the, uh, the the projects which which we uh, put together with the, with uh, as with the universities or also political school just to, 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 to increase the level of education and knowledge. Right. And I think that is a key for development nowadays. Right. Well, thank you. Um, Charles, Lord Mayor, we heard yesterday that you believe that trust is a very large part of it. Um, what do you see? I mean, you've heard some you know, focus on talent management, equality, integration, digital smart cities. Would you agree? Well, can I, I mean, first of all, delighted to be here. Uh, uh, wonderful to be in wonderful Chicago. And uh, I should just introduce myself. I, I'm actually the 690th Lord Mayor of our great city of London. Uh, often asked the question, gosh, have you been around for that length of time? To which I say personally, you know, and institutionally, you know, because we've had actually a Lord Mayor of the city of London for over 835 years. To your earlier question, so what is it that makes great centres, global centres. We, through, uh, through the City of London, London and Partners, and the GLA, have actually done a little bit of research as to, act, to demonstrate what really makes London so attractive. And we are, uh, as many will recognise, listed and ranked as number one in terms of financial and professional services, the international hub, the, the, the number one hub. And we've distilled that down to two very, very simple words, creative energy creative energy. And that is underpinned by a number of fundamentals that I referred to last night in the, in the speech I was able to give, and those being rule of law, history, culture, diversity, talent, education, taxation, regulation, innovation, infrastructure, time zone, language, security, probity, and a great place to live and to work. If I look at where we are at this moment in time, what we really are doing at this moment in London and the city of London is embracing that uh, creative energy, looking to the fu future. We have a phenomenal hub investing in uh, the fintech sector and technology and in innovation more, more widely. Um, that we've got a booming center of excellence in, in, that, in that regard. Technology being the horizontal, a whole series of verticals running off it. Um, so an exciting place. Right, right. I'm gonna come back later and ask each of you what are the big risks and what you shouldn't do in terms of building a great city? Um, and in part of that, I will have asked, because I'm sure many of the audience will be curious to hear how you cope with something like Brexit if you are in the city of London. But in the meantime, I'd just like to ask Will and Peter, I mean, in terms of what you've heard from the mayors about what they think is driving, or sorry, the mayor, mayor and the consultants about what they think is driving um, great cities, any surprises or anything that you would like to add in terms of the key developments? I, I don't think there's any surprises in the sense that, you know, the ingredients for a great city in terms of infrastructure, communications, the talent you need 
are well documented and understood. I think from Grant Thornton's perspective, we reflected on the role that we play as a, as a large corporate in the city. How do we, what role do we play in making the city successful? And if I can take you back to 2015, we actually spent a large amount of time thinking about our purpose as a company and actually what role do we play both in the city and the economy more generally. And actually, we look to help shape a vibrant economy, economy as our purpose. And it builds on what Charles was saying last night about building trust in business. We look at this through three pillars. One is actually how do we help build the trust and integrity in the economy? And that's crucial for London in terms of maintaining its leading position. The second element is actually how do we help the mid-market grow? How do we get the economic engine in the UK really growing? How, what role do we play? And that, again, overlaps into the, the wider city of London. And then thirdly, what role do we help play shaping the environment that enables the creative, creativity, economic growth? So we thought long and hard about what is our role. And actually, in order to actually take an active part rather than be a commentator, we've actually got involved in, and we worked with a number of the major cities in the UK looking at actually what are the challenges to their growth, what are the challenges to their economic prosperity. And recently we've um, undertaken a vibrant capital initiative in London where we've acted, acted as a convener to create the collaboration across the private, the public and the third sector. Now, we do want to make profit, but it's profit with purpose. And we see a role in actually how do we collaborate to ensure that London maintains its position as a leading city? What role do we play? So actually, I think for me, as well as the ingredients of infrastructure, retain your talent, it's actually everybody has to ask themselves, what is their role within that success? What, do, how, what part do they play? Rather than being an observer, what part do you actually play in making a city successful? Right. Peter. I think also the European Union has long recognized the, the political and economic power of city. And particularly in the conversation on the economic elements with cities we have, we, we realize there's sort of a bit, and I'm simplifying here, two groups. The one who, who want to catch up, and perhaps there's another group who really wants to be much more forward-looking and leading. And with that group, there's one thing we really emphasize very much in the conversation, which is data. Which sounds a bit mundane, uh, but every city is a gold mine. And cities very often do not realize that they sit on that gold mine, are not necessarily good in, in mining it, and, and have many questions of how to, how to go about that. Now, just, just to give you a data point, and I would like to probably finish even here, a data point is this, this economy about data has reached a size of 300 billion euro in 2016. We have run studies to look a bit forward what that means in the next few years, and that puts the figure for 2020 to 740 billion euro. So we are not talking about a technical aspect. We're talking about mainstream setting out the future of a city based on a data-driven economy. Right, right. Well, of course, that's a topic of great interest right now um, in the media and the political world um, about that data. And we do have panels later on discussing that because you know that question of smart cities is absolutely crucial and it's fascinating that almost everyone from Lagos through to Beijing, through to London, through to Warsaw are talking a lot about the data issue at the moment. Um, but I'm curious, you know, if you look at that list, you know, talent, education, lifestyle, data, integration, inclusion, these are all the key ingredients. Um, what shouldn't you do? What are the big risks though in terms of economic growth. I mean, the one that people are looking at in London right now is something like Brexit, which many people would say is a risk to economic growth. Um, tell us briefly how you see that as a risk, and then talk about the other risks you see to London right now. Okay. Um, well, look, I'm lucky enough to act as an ambassador for and on behalf of uh, the wonderful city of London, as I say, ranked number one in terms of its uh, status as the global uh, financial center of excellence for financial and professional services. We are not complacent, uh, far from it. Quietly competent, we've got a little bit of an obstacle that we're dealing with at this moment in time, but quietly competent. Um, you don't think the Brexit's gonna damage your position? 
we are, we're not complacent, very far from it. And what I recognize and what we recognize is that we need the appropriate deal, the right deal with our European partners that helps to preserve, and indeed, if we can possibly achieve it, enhance economic prosperity, not only for the UK, not only for the City of London, not only for our European partners, but more specifically for our global partners, uh, international uh, partners. And it's in the interest of all those related stakeholders to make sure that we achieve that appropriate deal. A deal as we promote with government and across all that stakeholder communities, the three T's as I call it. Transition, appropriate transition arrangement, trade, uh, I'll come back perhaps to that, but the appropriate uh, trade agreement built out of mutual recognition, mutual access, supervisory cooperation, uh, which is gaining great weight actually as we progress these, this agenda on a business to business level, and then talent too, making sure that we continue to have uh, open access to talent, that we can share the talent internationally, very critically. And of course, my fourth T, trust. Right. And do you see that, that sort of, if you like the political landscape as being the biggest risk to London's growth right now, or are there other risks? That... I, look, I, you know, I come back down to, uh, if there is another T to it all, technology. Um, uh, when I travel the world, I spend 100 uh, days of my year traveling internationally. I'll be to, uh, visiting some 30 countries through the course of, course of my given year. And actually, that T of technology and the fourth revolution, uh, digital revolution, and accessing London and all that we can provide and present is, is a tremendous opportunity for us, and I'm very excited with it. Right. Coyne, what keeps you awake in terms of the risk to Lagos? Yeah, um, three things. Uh, one is what I describe as confliction of time, um, you know, riding on technology. Uh, there's a rush to um, sort of leverage on technology to solve uh, the problems of the city. Uh, but, but what we begin to see is a lot of foreign investors and also domestic investors bringing solutions to government. But the fear is that a good number of those solutions are solutions for yesterday's problems. And so there's, there's a, a big problem um, of applying supposedly new technology trying to be innovative, but you're actually trapping yourself. So that's, that's one big, uh, big problem. The, the second big problem is, is the growth rate of Lagos. So it's, it's growing, as I said, at 86 people every minute. Every minute? Minute. And every hour, I'm sorry. sorry every hour. 86 every hour. But it's, it's a lot. So about 200 people come into Lagos every day, and about half of them stay and don't go again. And so it's been growing exponentially. Now, there is a government has to begin to be careful not to have the kind of migration problems they have in South Europe, um, like in Italy, where, or, or Germany at a point, where migrants uh, become to be seen as a problem and not part of a solution, as we had yesterday. Um, from, from the lady from Syria who, uh, who, who uh, composed uh, a piece on, on uh, the fact that migrants and refugees are an asset and not necessarily a burden. So that's, it, it, that's something that you know, worries me, um, that uh, the residents may begin to resist um, people that are coming in. Um, from Nigeria and West African countries, because now you're having a lot of people from neighboring countries coming in because of poverty right. uh, in those areas, and the increasing challenge of going up north uh, through the desert, because it's sort of suddenly getting more difficult, and Lagos is getting more pro prosperous. And the third thing that really, really worries me um, is the large divide between the rich and the poor. So the Rich are getting really, really rich, and slums are doubling in size. There were 42 slums in Lagos 20 years ago. There are over 100 slums now, and the conditions are, are very worrying. And um, if care is not taken, and government doesn't you know, uh, have a targeted approach on you know, bridging 
uh, that wide divide. Uh, it could turn into the kinds of things that you saw in Cairo um, or you saw in Tunisia, which was uh, you know, sort of things boiling from the other city. And that's why I talk of the tale of two cities. So Lagos really is two cities. Uh, yes. The city which has a nightlife, 24-hour uh, economy, thriving, a lot of innovation, center for banking in West Africa, um, has one of the best legal systems, great judiciary, you know, very much like England. But then you have this other part of, of Lagos, which is, which is uh, really terrible. So those three things uh, worry me. Right. Well, I think the theme of inequality is one that keeps you know, coming up over and over again, rightly so. And I think it's certainly something that will provoke more debate later today, not least because we need to start asking if, you know, whether the biggest problem today is also between the cities and the rural hinterlands and the fact that probably most people in the room talking about cities have more in common with each other than with some of the rural hint hinterlands. But, Hannah, I'd, I'd be curious to know from your point of view, from what, what are the things that keep you awake at night and make you worried? I think that unpredictability. Unpredictability. Uh, I think that uh, the general government and local government should be predictable because it's, uh, it's changed, you know, one day they say another thing, uh, one say these things, that another day uh, different things. So it's very dangerous for the de development of the city because it, it discour uh, discourages the investors to come, yes. And the second thing, uh, the, the, the consistency between words and activity, because sometimes you can hear many nice words, but activity is going in completely different direction. And the third thing which is very important is legal stability, uh, not influencing the jurisprudence, which can happen when there is a strong pressure for the jurisprudence from the decision makers. So I think that this thing is a nightmare of all decision makers on the level of the cities. Right, right. Wang. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, this is an excellent question because uh, what, what worries us uh, uh, and also me now is that uh, uh, we see the paradigm shift because in the, in the 20, 19th century you have a small town, 20th century you have mid-sized cities. Now you see mega cities. Mm. You know, I mean, for, for example, in China, the urbanization is one of the biggest transformations in the last four decades. And also now you see, you know, uh, there's a several, uh, you know, Bay Area is starting to come up, you know, Hong Kong, Macau, the Guangdong Bay Area, and then the Pearl River Delta, uh, Changjiang River, and Beijing, Tianjin, and, uh, and Hebei. So those, those mega cities are taking shape. So how can we cope with that? And then we are, we are facing also aging population as well. And, and as a matter of fact, so, uh, so these uh, this, uh, uh, mega cities and, uh, you know, how, if they can if they have to survive, they got to do international collaboration. Mm. They got to work with uh, all the international cities. So, so I think the, the next challenge is how we can really uh, get all those international cities uh, uh, together to work out the uh, common solutions to tackle those common problems. So uh, one of the things I think that uh, I, you know, our think tank, Center for China and Globalization, suggests to the Chinese government is that China should set up a national uh, department of immigration, uh, which is, uh, they just adopted, uh, actually uh, adopted my proposal. Oh. Set up a national department of immigration. Yeah, exactly. It's to, okay. to, welcome, to welcome all the global talents. Right. So returnees, talent, foreigners, foreign students. And, uh, you know, that, that's what's happening now. So I think, you know, boils down that to 3T, I think, you know, is that uh, uh, for, for, those, uh, for the modern city development, is that uh, a talent, uh, the technology, of course, I mean, how to manage those max cities, and finally the tolerance. You've got to integrate people. You've got to really have people coming together. And particularly in China, we got 300 million people in a city without permanent city, uh, without permanent status, the hukou system. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's probably the biggest challenge that China has is that how to integrate the 300 million rural area people that, uh, you know, that they can live in, in the city f forever. Right. You know, you don't have this every Chinese New Year, you got the one billion people move around China in one month. You know, once a time, once twice a time, they go home to see their children. So that's not, uh, uh, not normal. I think that's probably the biggest challenge. If, if those 300 million and 60 million children left behind, you know, you know that would be really... So I think a lot of progress has been made, but there's still mm. a lot of challenges we have to face. I must say, whenever I talk to friends from Nigeria or from China or places like that or India today, the sheer scale of the explosion in cities is absolutely astonishing. I mean, it's almost 
too much for our you know, minds to comprehend. I, I think China is also making a lot of change, like, like, like a speed train. Mm. You know, it's probably fastest growing you know, uh, in, in the world. And then also, yeah. all, many capital cities now have a subway. So those are changing, but I think the software right. uh, has to be improved. We're going to go to Q&A in just a moment, but before you're, while you're thinking of your questions, I'm curious, Peter and Will, do you have anything to add on this point? I mean, in terms of what cities must not do right now to, um, if they want to grow? I think um, in addition to the T, I would, I would add an H for housing. Right. As part of our vibrant capital work, we actually we convened a number of dinner sessions, but we also interviewed 2,000 normal Londoners across the 33 boroughs. Uh, we interviewed 1,000 graduates. And what the data told us that actually, at this point in time, a significant percentage, 16%, are planning to leave London. And a large proportion of that 16% were in the 25 to 34 year old. So the challenge we have is how do we retain that talent? Because um, securing a suitable home, a house that actually you can build um, life from, uh, ensure that the communities that we have are maintained is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge for London. And actually, if we don't somehow rise to that challenge, we could have a serious problem around retaining our talent. I think we'll always attract talent, that it's that retention and how do you keep that engine growth moving. So, you know, if I was looking at cities and how they're trying to emulate the, the New Yorks and London, there's actually really think seriously about the housing dynamic and what that means in terms of attracting and retaining talent. Um, just to give you, just to, we, we're actually looking at this very seriously. We're using our data analytics capability to understand. We're actually looked at how many houses, how many planning permissions were granted. So the, the number of planning permissions that were granted, and then how many houses were subsequently built within three years or started. Now, the mayor of London has a target of 66,000 homes. In 2015, 55,000 homes were given planning permission. By 2018, only 25,000 were actually started or built. Hmm. So through a combination of different factors, these houses are not being built. Right, right. So actually understanding the levers that the mayor, the city have around trying to stimulate that supply is going to be quite crucial. Well, of course, the mayor of Bristol spoke about that yesterday in a very thought-provoking set of remarks. Um, and one of the beauties of this whole event is that people can swap ideas and you know, learn from each other. Yeah. Peter, briefly, before you go to questions, anything you'd like to comment on, idea. other than make sure the internet works? <laughs> <laughs> the swapping idea is, I think, a good starting point. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Europe, about half the GDP is public sector GDP. So procurement is a super, super econ big economic factor. Most of it done in the metropolitan areas. Right. So we have set our eye a little bit on that. Uh, are we procuring here the most efficient, most effective solutions? Are we spending the money in the most wise way? And there's a lot of conversation in this fora. Yes, we, we have similar issues. Why don't we sort of cooperate? But when it comes to procurement, then suddenly everything becomes very specific, very different. So mm. I think we are not that good in, in eating our own dog food, you know, in, in this sector. So we, we in the European Union would like to push a bit in this direction, procure much more open systems, systems which can be shared between the major city and maybe regional cities and close to it. So I think one can have a hub and spoke model in right. these sort of environments. So this is something we want to spend more time. Well, that's a great point because, you know, procurement tends to seem to be so mind-numbingly dull in terms of the processes that it's often very hard to get you know, politicians or the voters to be very interested and want to have you know, much oversight. But as you say, in a place like Europe where half of the GDP is based on public sector, procurement is very, very important. And there's lots of ways to get efficiencies there. But um, let's go to the audience for questions. We do have some roving microphones, um, if any of you would like to ask a question. And it would be um, courteous, but not compulsory, to identify yourself. Please keep your question short and indicate who you'd like it asked to, if you would like to ask one. So, any questions um, out there? Got one towards the back. Hi. Um, thank you for your uh, excellent exposition. I have a question about, well, like, um, 
in Europe where 50% of GDP is public sector, how do you fight corruption? How do you keep that under control? So Peter, one yes. for you. Yes. Unless anyone else would like to jump in on this issue. Uh, how do you fight corruption? I think this is a very good question. And, and in, in the sense of you know, the, the rule of law, the application of, of regulations rules, the role of watchdogs, and, and also including the role of media very much in procurement is, is one which is very important. So I think it's the strengthening of the administrative system of, of the rule of law is a precondition if you have that sort of uh, high procurement volumes or high public sector intervention. Uh, I'm not sure if my colleagues would like to I, I, add. If I could just add, I think what Peter says in terms of setting the regulations and the, and the legal structure around the procurement and being absolutely clear how you follow those rules is, is critical. But what we're seeing increasingly in the UK, actually, uh, greater transparency. So actually, suppliers, bidders are able to, where they feel appropriate, challenge the decisions of procurement uh, authorities. So actually, that pre places greater onus on the procurement authorities to really run a transparent, robust process to ensure there's fairness and openness in the tender process. Coyne, do you want to jump in here? Because of course, you know, you can't talk much about economic development in Africa without dr addressing the corruption issue head on. Yes. Uh, well, so what we've done in Nigeria is, uh, first of all, we've been very aggressive uh, with um, arrest, invest investigations, trial and conviction. Uh, just last week, a governor was uh, sentenced to you know, 30 years in prison without an option of fine. And currently, there are over 20 um, governors, ministers, uh, permanent secretaries that are standing trial for corruption in Nigeria. Uh, the second thing is we, we work with a number of governments. Uh, so for instance, Lagos State Government is working with the US Embassy. Uh, they developed an app called Budget IT, um, which places the budget of Lagos State on a public platform and allows anyone um, to see how the money is being spent and to um, ask questions, and also, uh, if there is suspicion of corruption, you're allowed to you know, place it um, you know, on this app anonymously, and then that can be traced. Second very important thing that we've done um, is we have reduced the ability to deal in cash. A lot of corruption in third world countries is cash-based. Uh, so two things. One, you cannot withdraw or deal in cash more than 300 dollars maximum. So that just means you have to go to the bank so many times in order to get enough money uh, to give Mr. T here uh, to convince him to come to Lagos. Uh, so that's one thing. So you, you cannot withdraw cash. If we draw cash too often, uh, the system automatically reports you to the Drug Enforcement Agency and to the Corruption Agency. Third thing is that Every transaction that occurs in the banking system in Nigeria, unlike before, is trapped and captured. And so they know what everybody is, is, um, is doing. And then the last thing um, is biometric ver uh, verification. And that is sort of pushing a number of platforms. So you cannot deal with a bank without biometric verification. Um, so you have this BVN. Um, which is gathering database on everybody and uh, is stopping the ability of people to clone others. So that database is now being used for elections, um, is being used uh, for uh, tax, to, to you know, trace taxes. The tax man is now talking to the banks, is able to talk to the banks, and if they see that, um, say, a student has a large amount in the bank, the tax man would say, well, hi, um, you know, I don't want to know where you got the money, pay me my taxes on this. So there's a lot of disincentive that is being built into the system. And so things are getting slightly more difficult uh, for corrupt officials. Right. Well, that's fascinating. And um, I Hannah? I can add, uh, we have many uh, tenders of public offers by, via internet. So it is helpful, for example, for the last decade, we had uh, almost 4,000 
procurement uh, via internet. So it's very much more transparent in a different way. Second, you know, the regulation on the EU level uh, are so precise uh, that, uh, in fact, we have to follow. And third, I think that um, uh, also uh, the rules which oblige the, for example, mayor, vice mayor, many of my uh, clerks, uh, once a year we have to publish our assets. So it's, uh, what, what is the change between, for example, I am the mayor for the 12 years, so, so right. uh, yes, so also members of the parliament, also the ministers, vice ministers, so many people have to publish and show the assets every year. So back to Peter's point about data being one of cities' greatest riches and in some ways one of their greatest tools they can use to promote more transparency. I'm just curious, before we go to the next question, Wang, obviously China has been grappling with corruption issues in a fairly high profile way. Um, do you think that that has gone down an effective path? Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting question. I think in China, you know, in the last 40 decade, four decades, uh, the, 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 the economy is, is accelerating so fast, and then corruption is also rampant, is, is widely spread. But I think since uh, President Xi came into position five years ago, they started a really heavy, uh, you know, anti-corruption campaign launched, and then several hundred minister level officials were toppled, mm. which is unprecedented, and including some very high uh, leaders of, in the government. So one of the things they have think they are trying to do now is set up a national supervisory inspection uh, in a committee so, so that this newly established, you know, it has an independent power to really send the inspection team to all the ministries, governors, and also in, on the environmental side, on, on the audit side. So, so this actually uh, is strong, st strongly strengthened, I think. So that helps a lot now. Right. Uh, of course, I mean, this still keeps coming, but then at least there's a mechanism to deal with that so that they keep them uh, under a certain level of control. Interesting. Yeah. Um, question right at the back, over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ron Nazer from uh, DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, the range of, of your experiences is striking, and I was just wondering, as you talked about the problems that you all face, how important the culture is in each one of your countries, each one of your cities. As an example, the Lord Mayor mentioned yesterday, he's the 690th mayor drawing on a long history are these generic problems that you all face or the fact of your history, your culture, impact and change the kinds of problems that you all have? Uh, Charles, do you feel energized or intimidated that you're 671st? Uh, 690th. Sorry, 690th. Sorry, <laughs> I... And as I say, we've had a Lord Mayor in place for over 835 years. Uh, some were a little bit greedy in the early years of being a Lord, Lord Mayor. But, uh, you know, culture is a critical element to it, um, an absolutely critical element to it. Um, and part of the piece on, on my own business of trust program, underpinning all of that, if I had a, I mentioned five key um, findings from it, if there was a sixth, it would be all around uh, culture. And in my own sort of 15 fundamentals that I referred to earlier, rule of law, history, culture is number three. So culture is a really critical feature. Okay, uh, what, I, what I'd like to say is this. So, um, given the influence of the um, 698th mayor of London on the people of Lagos and Nigeria, at the time, we all wanted to be like me, you know, three-piece suits, tie, and so on and so forth. Uh, but today in Nigeria, and there's, there's, there's some hair, there's Bemi hair, uh, Nigerians are proud to wear Nigerian clothes, Nigerian culture. Um, so um, yeah, I, I like to listen to music um, by Jimmy Jagger and by James Brown. But you know, people who sort of are responsible for 70% of the population don't know uh, American musicians or British musicians. They listen to Nigerian music. Um, they now watch Nigerian movies. So in terms of culture, one of the things that is driving Lagos now um, is, is, is culture, is fashion, is music. So it's an industry that has gone from $3 billion to 6.4 and growing. So culture is playing a big part in creating employment, 
um, in Nigeria, one thing I'll talk about very quickly um, is parties. So part of our culture is to celebrate. So uh, the day a child is born, we have a party. Eight days after, we have a party. Um, when the child is one, there's a party. 10, 21, graduation. Then when you're getting married, we have about six parties. We write a letter, we reply the letter, engagement, and they go the marriage. The town. Yes, yeah. so she knows about it. And these are like carnivals. And so this is huge and it's developed you know, a big industry. So culture plays a key part uh, in growing uh, the economy and in um, drawing people to the city because there are people that live in other cities who, found it, uh, who find it dowdy. Charles, I can see you're dying to say Charles, something. Yes. I would just add in there, culture combined with diversity, uh, which is a point I should have made a little earlier. I would right. like to. Right. Yeah, I, I would like to add, I think you know, the, the world is getting smaller. I mean, we are, we are a global village now. I mean, the, uh, the challenges now, I think, if, if, you know, thousand years ago, maybe there's, uh, the, the emperor is, uh, is far away and the mountain is high, and, uh, and you have thousands of tribes of different cultures. But now, you know, with the internet age, the culture is converging. I think the, the, you know, there's a universal culture now, basically, with the instant uh, communication, uh, you know, thousands of flights every day. For example, when I came to the US, uh, 40 years, you know, 30 some years ago, there's only one flight a day from China to the US. Mm. Now you've got hundreds. So, so you know, I, I think the culture is really, there's a universal culture, is gradually expanding and expanding. So, so I think, you know, that, that's also influenced each other as well. Right. Like urbanization and all those, uh, you know, education and, uh, and, uh, and all else, yeah. I don't, I'm, yes. sure, I'm sure you don't agree, do you? Yes, I think that uh, culture is very important. So, for example, if you, uh, take the case of Warsaw, we constructed uh, two very important museums, Museum of Chopin, Museum of Poland, where is the, a very unique museum of the history of uh, Polish Jews for 1,000 years, and it became very, uh, very popular, both of them. And, uh, and uh, we, we supervise, we are organizers of 18 theaters, one eight. So it's a lot, and there are many private and uh, different other kinds of theaters. And uh, of course, there are competition for Chopin and, and many others, and we use the culture as the uh, really um, very important, uh, um, I would say, instrument of uh, right. attracting, attracting uh, people. Uh, and of course, they are also for the domestic right. uh, to visitors, but also for the foreign visitors. Right. Well, Unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but we've had a great set of thoughts shared from a very diverse set of perspectives. Um, lots of the letter T, which is driving successful cities, talent, technology, transparency, and trust, and of course, transport. Um, we have a letter H as well, housing, people are pointed to. Um, we also have a letter P, procurement, as being a key issue, but perhaps one of my favorite, because it a certain degree sums up what we're doing here, is the power of parties to drive exuberant <laughs> culture too, or exuberant cities as well. So thank you all very much indeed for your thoughts. I look forward to hearing these developed later on today. And um, best of luck to all of you who are involved in building vibrant cities in taking that forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.